we're going to do things a little bit differently here today. My wife said that I shouldn't be giving her long, uh, voluminous introductions, although I think she deserves it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you First Lady, uh, what was her name again? Stephanie Ann Mayberry. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I didn't get a chance to say that when you guys came in because it was like scooting in, but it's really good to see all you guys. Amen. We have been dealing a lot lately with the Holy Ghost, not not just people in this room, but other people that we've been talking to. And I thought it was time to dig up an old lesson that I have done a few times on the Holy Ghost. It gets pretty comprehensive, and I'm actually working on a book about it. Um, but I'm going to talk about that today. Because it really doesn't get talked about enough at the depth and the level that it needs to. A lot of times we walk into the apostolic church. We uh, hear about the Holy Ghost. We see evidence of the Holy Ghost. But nobody really tells you what it is, why you need it, how you get it. And sometimes they just sneak up on you and ambush you and they try to make you get it. And you don't even know that that's what's happening. And it's a little disconcerting. Um, I, I didn't know anything about it whenever I first started in going to the apostolic church. When I first really came to that portion of the truth. And, um, I certainly didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost because that just wasn't taught in the background that I came from. I, I grew up Baptist. We did not speak in tongues. In fact, often uh, we were told that tongues was of the devil. And um, I don't know if they still teach that, but I know that they did when I was young. And um, so I walk into my first apostolic church. I didn't know what was going on and I sure didn't know what to do. And I had a lot of questions. I wanted to know why are they crying? Why do they have their arms raised? You know, why are they running around? Because they were people running and jumping and dancing. And it, it was just a whole different environment to me. And then the tongues thing, I had no clue what that was. And, um, and, and nobody was explaining it. And I understand that you can't go into every single service and have a comprehensive explanation of the Holy Ghost, but there was no, no explanation going on anywhere. Um, I saw that in every episode. And we went to some really good apostolic churches. I saw it in, in every one, though. Uh, there was never just a time that was devoted solely to this. Everybody was jumping around. They were really in the Holy Ghost, speaking times. Now I understand it, and it makes a lot of sense to me. But uh, it, it would have helped to have some instructions. So uh, let's talk about getting the Holy Ghost, why we need it, what it is, and hopefully answer a lot of questions that people that are new to this would have. Um, Sometimes a person will get the Holy Ghost and they know why. A lot of times they don't. And I will tell you, it can be pretty intimidating. The first time, I had only been in the church for just a couple of months. And um, I had been watching these people really getting into the spirit and and then one time it happened to me. I was walking out of the the sanctuary. It was actually a, a school where we were having it. They were set up in a gym. And I was walking out into the hall 
where they had all the snacks after service. And this group descended on me. And they cornered me and I was backed against the wall. And of course, they're all like down here because I'm really tall. And they're, you know, they're praying in tongues and they're looking at me and they're yelling and somebody's got my head. They're doing like this. It was scary. And um, and I'm feeling pressed against the wall. I can't escape because there's people on both sides. And as soon as I could get out of there, I was gone. Of course, I was back the next week. But at that point, I was just gone. I remember I was really quiet the rest of the day, kind of trying to process what was happening. Because I had seen them really getting, I guess, excited. But uh, it, it seemed almost violent. And that's really, I, can, I understand now the importance of it. And maybe they got caught up in how important it is to have the Holy Ghost. But I didn't understand it at that time. And they were coming at basically a babe and scaring me half to death. My My husband, who wasn't my husband at the time, he started teaching me i think he kind of picked up on i was pretty shell-shocked and he started teaching me things a little bit at a time and started opening up my understanding and i started to see the value of it once i saw what the bible had to say about the holy ghost then i could see the value of it and it started to make some sense and i wanted to share with you one of the things that i wrote about getting the holy ghost because apparently this experience is not uncommon it's, i said one day i wrote this shortly after i got it so that because I, I write down everything i just for no i just write down everything let's just leave it at that one day not long after that incident where they cornered me in the hall i was brushing my hair in the bathroom and suddenly i felt this peace and comfort come over me that caused a perfect calm in my mind and body it was like I was suspended in warm water, weightless and floating. Before I could even think about what was happening, I felt a gentle pressure in my throat, like like words were forming, but in my mind there was nothing but a calm or a peace. There were no words. I opened my mouth because I felt like that was what I needed to do, it kind of instinctual and and my vocal cords tongue and mouth just began to form sounds but they weren't under my control the sounds flowed like this beautiful sweet waterfall and the swirling that was in my body increased and i started speaking in tongues and i wasn't sure what was going on so i freaked out a little bit and I didn't really know what had just happened to me. And so I did the only logical thing I could think of. I called my husband, who was not my husband at the time. And uh, this is the conversation because he enjoys this a lot. I said, hey, I think I have a brain tumor. He says, why do you think that? And I said, I was brushing my hair and this feeling came over me and I started speaking in a language I don't know. So I'm pretty sure I have a brain tumor. And he says, okay, tell me that again. And I said, okay. I didn't know why I was having to repeat myself, but I said I was brushing my hair and I got this weird feeling and I started speaking in another language. So I think I have a brain tumor. And he said, you don't have a brain tumor. And I said, how do you know? And he said, well, because I know. You don't have a brain tumor. You were fine. You just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you were speaking in tongues. And I said, how do you know these things? You sure I don't have a brain tumor? Are you sure I don't need to go see a neurologist? And he says, I have been doing this a long time. And no, you don't need to see a neurologist and you don't have a brain tumor. You just got the Holy Ghost. And I told him, I don't know how to feel about this. I mean, I wanted it to happen, but this was weird. And he said, it's wonderful. 
and now I know that it's wonderful, but at the time it did feel weird. Uh, I was not used to relinquishing control. I understand that now. I didn't understand that then. Most Christians or people who are believers or people who are trying to live this whole Bible, they talk about the Holy Spirit, but they they really don't know what it means. They They think they know. And um, I have found that a lot of times what is taught about the Holy Ghost is a lot different from what the Bible teaches. It, it's a lot of man-made insertions. So in this, we're going to start from the very beginning. I've got a ton of scripture that we're going to go through, but that's really the best way to explain to you, to show you what the Bible says. Um so we're going to talk about what the bible says about the holy ghost everything in the bible is there to teach you something sometimes it's more than one thing actually it's it's in layers so you understand it from one perspective and later on you come back as you've grown and you understand it from another perspective and it goes on and on like that it builds it doesn't happen at the same time because you, you, we would be overloaded. We would be completely overwhelmed. There is nothing, no, there's absolutely nothing in scripture that is, is esoteric or, or pointless. Or it's just there for entertainment purposes. Nothing. Every single thing means something. Every word has a purpose it's there's there's a lesson in everything there's usually several lessons if you look um some some will understand that when you first come to god you know that that there's there's things that they come with these these misconceptions that what has been taught to them over the pulpit is what is the gospel and that's not true i'm sorry most of the time that is absolutely not true and when i say when they come to god i'm talking about when they come into this whole bible like we are living now because if you were not having spirit and truth if you don't have torah and the the acts 238 experience you are not living the whole bible and you are not a true believer so when I say coming to God, that's what I'm talking about when you have that whole experience. Um, we're going to start with Paul on the road to Ephesus. And this is usually not a place where a lot of people who teach the Holy Ghost start. But I think it's really important here because it gives you a picture. It puts a picture in your mind. It's a story and it's something that everybody can relate to. So this occurred several years after Yeshua was crucified and he rose again and ascended. It was, you know, after Pentecost, every, when the Holy Ghost built everything. And um, well, it was after Paul's conversion. So this is some time ago. And Paul ran into these disciples and he recognized them. And I'm going to read this scripture here because they considered themselves to already be saved. That is an important point to make here. I don't think that's brought out enough, but this is important to bring out because if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I've already got this, I'm already saved, I'm already good, pay attention to how these guys handled it. I say, guys, we don't know if they were men or women. It doesn't say, but it, watch the attitude. This is uh, for reference, Acts 19, 1 through 6. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, John was verily 
John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, which is on Yeshua. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Yeshua. And, then, and when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, he, Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost? They didn't say, oh, well, no, but that's okay. I'm good. He said, um, they said, we don't even know the Holy Ghost. We haven't heard of the Holy Ghost. They were being presented with information that they didn't have yet. And they they didn't stop and say, well, I'm good. No, I've already got it. I've already been baptized. I don't need to be baptized again. They didn't say that. They listened to what this man of God had to say. And they they waited to see, okay, so there's some truth here. And they followed through with it. That attitude of being open is so important in, in all of this. Because if you think you have the Holy Ghost, but you haven't spoken in tongues, you don't have the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, you haven't been filled. That's just, that's the book. That's the Bible. But it's taught different. That is unfortunately not taught in a lot of churches. They didn't tell Paul that they were good or that they were already saved. They didn't argue and they didn't debate him. They stopped. They listened to see if this was new information. It resonated with them and, and they did it. No argument. I mean, really, what are you going to lose by being baptized in the name of Yeshua? Even if you've already been baptized in titles, what are you going to lose? Because if, if you're wrong, then nothing you got you lost nothing but if if you're if i'm if i'm right and you do need to be baptized in the name of yeshua and you don't do it because you think you've already done it in in titles yeah well you're going to lose a lot it's going to have a tremendous impact on your your the eternal destination of your soul the thing that made them different was they were hungry. And when they were hungry and they wanted to keep growing in God, it affected their attitude. So if you think you're just going to sit here and you don't have to grow anymore and you don't have to take any more steps in any direction, you're not hungry. And that is not, that is not a godly attitude that is not holiness the bible teaches against this we're not supposed to be static we're not just supposed to sit there we are supposed to be growing and moving and constantly moving forward and teaching and reaching deeper and deeper and deeper to get that relationship and that's what getting the holy ghost is it is a level of intimacy that that nurtures that relationship with your creator and you can't get it any other way and when they heard that truth and they understood this is a level of relationship with god that we haven't been able to reach yet they surrendered they surrendered to him so what exactly is the holy ghost the Bible tells us several things. In 1 John 1, 14, it says that the Holy Ghost is God's spirit. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Yeshua, he is none of his. So that gives us all three right there. It's all the, They're all the same. Yeshua is God. The Holy Ghost, God's Spirit. So that that is a, uh, you get a little two for there. And if Yeshua is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Yeshua from the dead 
dwell in you, he that raised up Yeshua. I lost my place. Raised up Yeshua from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit. And um, and that's Romans 9 through 11 too. Uh, it says, but God hath revealed unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man know, knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God know no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. It's 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 12. So we're seeing a recurring theme here. It goes over and over. And I have a lot of scripture and some of it I'm just not including because it's a lot. If you want the, the scripture, reach out to me. I'll be glad to send you everything. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is also important for salvation. And it's first explained in Acts 2, Acts 2.38 to be exact. Um, from that point on, after Yeshua ascended, when someone was filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. That was the evidence. Whenever Yeshua was baptized, there was evidence. We said, we see that, um, you know, the Holy Ghost came down like a dove. So there's always going to be evidence when that occurs. Once he ascended, once the Holy Ghost fell at Pentecost, then that evidence became tongues. And it's demonstrated over and over. It's undeniable. Acts 2.38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Yeshua for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost was prophesied and God made a lot of promises about the Holy Ghost. Um, he promised that he would that he would give the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, 16 and 17, he there were there's uh references to that prophecy, but uh the prophecy actually was from Ezekiel. It says uh Ezekiel 36, 26. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble seeing. Let me try that. Um, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. In Joel 2, 28 and 29, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Oh, thank you. Light. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. This was a promise. It, it promised of a very intimate experience that would increase your relationship with Jehovah God. It's like a marriage. You have to have that intimacy in order for a marriage to thrive. And, and if you're going to have a relationship with, with God, you have to have that, that level of intimacy. The Holy Spirit is for everyone. Acts 2, 38 and 39, it, it tells you right there that it is for everyone, but not everyone gets it in the same way, and um, they don't always get it. Some people get it before they get baptized. Some people get it after they get baptized. Some people come up out of the water speaking in tongues. Some people, it takes a long time after they're baptized. It, it depends on the person, and, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, too. Um, let's see, Acts 8, 14 through 17. 
Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of Yeshua. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So these people were already baptized, and then um, they received the Holy Ghost later. They, uh, it just took them going and praying for them, and, and they laid hands on them, and they received it. It, it different people are going to do this in different ways and there's no right or wrong way and it's important to understand that because i've seen a lot of people looking around and saying well she got it first and you know, or you know he got it right away or you know that person came up out of the water speaking in tongues what's wrong with me what's well, not necessarily what's wrong with you and there may be some stuff that has to be worked out but you're not you you can't compare yourself to other people you can't compare your experience to other people just let let that be something between you and god let him work on you give him you know and give yourself a break and acts 10 46 they heard them speak with tongues and magnify god that was cornelius that was the house of cornelius the whole house received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they all spoke in tongues. And then, and it was after that that Paul baptized them. So see, in this one, they got the Holy Ghost, and then they were baptized. And it's important to note when you read that, when you read the whole portion of that, Paul was like, we got to get him in the water now. They were just, um, or was Peter. I'm sorry, Peter. It was, you know, get them in the water now. There was an immediacy to it. But don't try to put yourself in somebody else's box. Um, you're not going to fit. What is good for one may not be good for you. So uh, just just follow follow what where God is leading you, and and talk to Him about it because you can talk to Him just like you're you're talking to someone sitting in front of you and just talk to him about it what happens when you get the holy ghost i get that question a lot and there are a lot of things that happen in your life that um ways that you are changed and i'm going to go through a list of some of these it is tremendous and i will say this when you are over on this side of the fence and you have not yet received the holy ghost it's very difficult to be able to put your mind into that position of after you have it you have to have the experience in order to understand a lot of these so for if you don't have the holy ghost yet some of this is going to be book knowledge but it's going to give you something to look for so that once you do have the holy ghost you're going to be looking for these things. You're going to be looking for these changes. Acts 1 and 8 says that we receive power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. 2 Corinthians 3.17, you're going to have freedom. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Romans 15, 13, you have hope. Now the God of hope fills you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Ezekiel 26, 36, you will get a heart of flesh, so obedience. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. You have a bent toward obedience once you have the Holy Ghost. Once he has filled you with his spirit, you are working in tandem with that spirit. That spirit is working in you, but you are working with it because you still have your will. 
but you are more inclined to that obedience to the word. As long as you're hungry and willing. Romans 5.5, 5, you get love. This is, a, this is one that shakes some people up, but Romans 5.5, 5, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of Jehovah is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Now, a little side note here, in 1 John 4, 7 through 18, it says you cannot love without, without Jehovah or without his spirit in you. You can't truly love. You can have a certain degree of love, but you don't have that, that true, honest, pure love until you have the Holy Ghost. 1 John 4, 7, 18. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of Jehovah. And everyone that loves is born of Jehovah and knows Jehovah. He that, that loveth not knoweth not Jehovah, for Jehovah is love. So uh, you get a whole different level of love. It's like nothing you've ever experienced before. 1 Corinthians 2.13, you get an increased understanding. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. John 16, 13, you get truth. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. John 15, 26, helper and comforter. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Romans 8, 26, 27, you will get healing. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us within groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what it is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, according to the will of Jehovah. Now this is not just a physical healing. There's emotional healing. There's there's spiritual healing. And all of that is available to you with the Holy Ghost. Yeshua does heal, and he heals unsaved people all the time. But whenever you have the Holy Ghost, I'm talking about a whole new level of healing. Things that, that he roots down in and, and just digs out of you things that were buried, things that you don't even know are tormenting you or hurting you. John 7, 37 and 38, you have rivers of flowing water. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It makes you better at ministering in all ways, whether you're teaching, whether you're laying hands on people and praying for healing for them, whether you're delivering them of things. Ephesians 1, 13, 14, it's the guarantee of our inheritance. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. Thing is, this right now is not as good as it gets. In fact, every single day, that you are living in this every single day that you are living 
in the Holy Ghost is not as good as it gets because every day it gets better. If you are allowing yourself to grow, it just gets better and better. Titus 3, 6, you get a renewing, which is given by his mercy, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Yeshua. John 14, 17, having the Holy Ghost allows you to walk with Yeshua like the disciples did and it makes you like him because you have his spirit in you you're going to exhibit his characteristics even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not neither knows him but you know not for he dwells in you and shall be in you acts 1 and 8 you you become an effective witness for yeshua you become a better teacher if you are not in if you do not have the holy ghost right now and you're teaching get the holy ghost when you have the holy ghost your teaching will be phenomenally better but you shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth you will reach people in ways that you cannot without the Holy Ghost. Because once you have the Holy Ghost, you're not working in your flesh anymore. You are working on a spiritual level. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, as much as you love God, you are still operating in your flesh. And you can't go beyond that because you don't have his spirit in you. But once his spirit is in you, it makes you a more effective teacher. And I'm not saying don't teach. If you've got truth, teach. But keep pursuing the Holy Ghost. Keep pushing for it. Jude one twenty, The Holy Ghost helps you with prayer. But you beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Romans 8.27 and he intercedes for believers in accordance with the will of God. And that is so important. Side note here, when you're praying, make sure you're always pursuing the will of God in these things. In everything you pray for, you're looking for the will of God. It's not what you want. It's what he knows is best for you. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Oh, and his provision is probably not going to look like what you think it does or like it should. His provision is probably going to be vastly different from what you think you need or certainly what you want. So be prepared for that. But it's always better. It's always better. Romans 8.27 And he that searcheth the hearts knows what the mind of the, what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of Jehovah. If the Holy Ghost is making intercession for the will of Jehovah in your life, you should be too. Galatians 4, 16 and 18 leads believers into righteousness. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. Acts 10.38. He is a healer and a deliverer. The same as Yeshua. That's an important part to, point to make here. How God anointed Yeshua of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed for the devil. For God was with him. Oh, I did put that. John 3.6. It gives us life at the new birth that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit it is the spirit that gives us life god breathed into adam he breathed his spirit into adam and adam became alive when you receive the holy ghost 
it's because God breathes into you and you become truly alive. That is when that, that new birth occurs. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it produces good fruit in the believer. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. You might not always exhibit all those fruits, but it makes you better at exhibiting those fruits more consistently because we are still human, but at least we can repent. And and I have found that the longer I've had the Holy Ghost, I don't have to repent quite as much, but I do still repent every day. Um, so the, the question then becomes, how do you get the Holy Holy Ghost? Acts two thirty eight shows shows you pretty uh pretty clearly. Repent, baptism in the name of Yeshua, and um and then you receive that promise. And uh, repent, baptized every one of you in the name of Yeshua for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Luke eleven thirteen tells us that God wants to give you his spirit. So that is the understanding. When you have that understanding, um, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You ask. And you have the understanding right here that he wants to give it to you. He wants to give you everything. And the Holy Spirit is everything. But um, you have to have hunger. Matthew 7, 7 through 8 says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks receives. And he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. You just, you have to have a hunger for it. And you have to ask him. And you have to expect it. First Timothy 2, 3 and 4. You got to have faith. It is God's desire that everyone is saved. It is God's desire that everyone be filled with his spirit. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. There's another reference to um, oneness. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You have to be humble. Luke 14, 11, Let God exalt you. For whosoever exalts himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Be humble enough to let God exalt you. Be, be humble enough to recognize who and what you are in relation to him. That's meekness. Understand that he is great and mighty over all things. That ultimately everything is his everything you have is his everything you are is his and surrender to that because when you fight it you are just it's like trying to be on the stormy seas in a ship and the more you fight with that wheel to turn it against those against those crashing waves the more you're going the more likely you are to crash your ship into the rocks but whenever you let it go and go with that and move with that water, you're going to uh, you're going to get to safety. You have to surrender. And that's brings me to my next point. Surrender. James four seven. You have to submit yourself to God. Submit yourselves therefore to Jehovah. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have to pursue him. You have to come to him and seek the things of God. John 7, 37 and 38. In the last day, 
that great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Pursue him. Now, the last one I included is actually a promise. Because if you do all these things, there is a promise. Matthew 5 and 6. If you hunger for it, you will be filled. The Holy Spirit is righteousness, and it's a blessing. You will be blessed for your hunger. You will be blessed for your obedience. You will be blessed for your pursuit, for seeking him, for, for doing these things, for your humility. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So, how do you know when you have the Holy Ghost? I've heard people say, oh, well, I felt it. I just felt different. Well, I've had a good meal and I felt different, but that doesn't mean I have a Holy Ghost. The way that the Bible gives, the only evidence that the Bible gives is tongues. Mark 16, 17 and 18. Yeshua said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. That's all believers. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This is for all believers. This is for people who receive his spirit. Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's not you might. It's not you could. It's not... Well, it's probably going to happen. He said, you shall. So when you're walking in obedience, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 10, 44 and 48, Peter, in the house of Cornelius, while Peter spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that of the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now the Gentiles were not considered holy at that time. So that's why everybody's going, oh my goodness. You can't let your station or your status affect what you think or anybody's station or status affect what you think that whether they should or should not have the Holy Ghost. Because it's for everybody. It's for the very poor. It's for the uneducated. It's for the wealthy. It's for the people with multiple doctorates. It's for everybody. And just because you think, oh, I've done all this stuff in my life that's terrible. Or, oh, I've been so you know, beat up on all my life. It doesn't matter. Not any of that matters. If you earnestly pursue god with your whole heart if you seek after him if you humble yourself if you walk in obedience then you'll then you will receive the holy ghost because he wants to give it to you none of us are worthy but he wants to give it to you it's something he wants to give you and all you got to do is this they 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 heard they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water? See, it was immediate that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well. So if you do, or if you are in a position where you receive the Holy Ghost and you have not yet been baptized in the name of Yeshua, you need to find somebody to baptize you in the name of Yeshua quickly. They didn't waste any time in scripture. Um, oh, and yeah, this that was another one. Paul on the road to Ephesus, Acts 19 and 6. When Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with other tongues and prophesied. Now, I'm going to go even further and say that many, many people who claim to have the Holy Ghost do not. And you know, there's ways that you can tell scripture gives us several examples as well as instructions on what that looks like it's really another lesson for another day but just 
um, if a person's experience does not line up with scripture, the, the scripture that we've even gone over here, if it's not lining up with scripture, that's suspect. Um, they may have had some experience or some encounter, but it may not have been the infilling. And uh, then there are people who can have that momentary infilling of the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues, but they don't follow through with that continued obedience or surrender or the things that need to be done. And um, at, at that point, they have some serious work to do. Again, that's another lesson for another day. Now, I get a lot of people that ask me what it is like whenever you get the Holy Ghost. I can give you my experience. And from what I've heard of other accounts, when people described to me, because when I first began to understand I needed the Holy Ghost, I just went around asking people, what does it feel like? And they were like very seasoned saints. And they're like, well, I don't really know how to explain it or I don't know. So I'm going to answer that question right now. This is my experience and yours may be different, but the people that I have talked to about this that were able to express it to me, it's been similar. It is an airy feeling. I say airy, it's light. There's a buoyancy. Uh, there's, I get a pressure, not uncomfortable, but just this, this feeling in my throat or my mouth, like it's full of words that you didn't put there. You know, whenever you're actually speaking consciously, you know, your mind already knows what you're going to say and you're saying it. This is something that comes from not the mind, but it comes from somewhere way down here and it comes up and it's like it just fills your, your mouth and your throat. And you may even feel like your mouth is starting to move on its own in a response. Although some people like, you know, me try to control that at first. Um, but it's kind of a breathy feeling like the air is going out of, of my mouth. But if you feel that, that lightness or that peace or that feeling that is, that is in your chest, just surrender to it. Don't try to stop it. Just let it flow. Now, there are several things I've heard. Some people say, say hallelujah, you know, because the important thing is to get your mouth moving. You get some sound going because it's easier for that stuff to flow once you're already in action because then you're not having to start from a base. You're actually already in action, so it's easy for that to occur. Some people say hallelujah. Some people say Yeshua. Um, some people say Jesus, if they do not understand Yeshua yet, that's fine. Um, I have found one of the things, whenever I feel, even when I feel stuck sometimes, saying move God, move God, move or Abba, which is Father. These are these are things that it's it's a praise which ushers in the presence of God, but it also gets you already moving. It gets your spirit moving in that direction. Your your body is already engaged in the vocals. And you say it loud enough so that you can hear it yourself. You don't have to say it real loud so that everybody hears it. It's that's not necessary. Uh, it helps if, you know, you've got your pastor or someone ministering to you, trying to pray you through. They need to hear it uh, because the evidence is for them, too. Um, but it might help if you close your eyes. Just focus completely on him. Let the world fall away. Um, but as you say whatever it is that you say, you might even pray, you know. Fill me, please, fill me. But as you say those things, you might feel that your mouth and your tongue start moving in a direction that you are not consciously causing it to move. Just follow that. Let it flow. 
keep breathing. Some people stop breathing. Um, keep breathing. <laughs> That's important because you need breath. Um, but you know, sometimes moving your head back and forth because whenever you are responding to the spirit, a lot of times we will move our body automatically just starts moving and that is a a response to to the moving of the spirit we're moving with that flow uh some people rock but just a gentle movement and you just respond and, and it's just really a signal that god is moving if you're feeling if you're feeling like you need to move it's because god's moving on you right now um and just let it go because that's part of the surrender when uh but when god is moving on you you don't want to try to control any aspect of it you can't control it uh, you can stop it but that would be to your detriment that's something you don't want to do and don't worry about the people around you if you're in a situation where you're around people who are ministering to you they've already seen this they've been through it and they just want to see you burst <laughs> But they just want to see it um so when it happens everybody it's it's going to be a lot of rejoicing nobody's going to make fun of you nobody's going to look at you you know crazy nobody's going to think you're weird or odd or strange nobody's going to say you did it wrong uh, nobody's going to correct you or they shouldn't um if somebody says anything unkind walk away I, I know someone who had an experience like that it's not it should never be that way but you it's it's okay let people hear you because we all we all want to see it happen for you and um if you can raise your hands that is even more surrender and that's good too now there are some barriers some people experience barriers to getting the holy spirit uh acts 8 18 through 22 talks about this or talks about one that's a pretty big one and when simon saw that through laying on of the apostles hands the holy ghost was given he offered them money saying give me also this power on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this day of thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. your heart has to be right you have to be right with god in order for this to happen um and if you have things in there that you need to repent repent and that's a big one unrepented sin is pretty common um self-consciousness which comes from trust issues spirit of rejection which comes from trust issues you feel unworthy again that often has to do with trust issues you're unwilling to surrender that's also trust issues you want to be in control that's also trust issues fear trust issues actually a lot of it has to do with really trusting god to keep you safe in this new experience and he will some people they don't believe it or they don't believe it's for them or they don't believe it's necessary so unbelief is is a big one unrepented sin some people just can't relax that's why you get a person who can't do anything they're kind of just stony when they're in a group but then they go off into their workshop or they're brushing their hair and they're alone by themselves and all of a sudden the holy ghost falls on them and they're talking in tongues um they're, they're distracted we live in a very busy world and 
you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Sometimes it's important to just be still, just be quiet. You know, a portion of your prayer should be spent being quiet. You know, you pray, we pray and pray and pray, and we've got all these words flying around, but then you have to be still and let him move too. Arrogance, lack of humility, that's a big one. That also comes from fear. So there's there's many other things that could be keeping you, but that is those are kind of the most common ones. So after that happens, then what's next? Well, if you haven't been water baptized, then you need to be water baptized. Um, But know that the holy baptism of the Holy Ghost requires submission. And, and it's a gift that's given to you for your obedience. Or after you have been obedient to him. When you are obedient. When you're walking in obedience. And it's something that, that should be present every day. When you pray, you, you have a, you will find yourself starting to pray in tongues. And, and that is that ongoing connection, that ongoing intimacy with God. And you should be pursuing that. It should be something done every day because if you are not intimate with your spouse on a daily basis, if you are not having that level of intimacy with them, your relationship's not going to work out so great. And it's the same thing with God. If you're not seeking that that intimacy with him, then you're, you're not going to have that, that level of relationship that you should. But uh, Yeshua even told us that um, that we're supposed to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In thy name you shall cast out devils. You shall speak with new tongues. You shall take up serpents. And if you drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. You shall lay hands on the sick and recover. And that is what it is to walk in obedience to God and, and carry his spirit with you everywhere. So I'm going to tie it up here. Um, we are to go out and we're going to, we're supposed to preach the gospel, all of us. We're supposed to exhibit those signs of the believers. We're supposed to have the fruits of the spirit. But all that hinges on having the Holy Ghost. And um, we know this because it's what the Bible says. And like I said, there's so much more. But if if you want the rest of these scriptures, if you want the whole scripture, because I pulled out portions or we'd be here all day. But if you want the whole scripture to see everything, of course, you could always just go and read it in context. Then let me know and I'll be glad to send it to you because this is a study that if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you really need to dive deep into it and study it out so that you can understand. And because with some people that helps understanding what it is what what you benefit from from having it sometimes that helps um but you should have a solid understanding of the of the baptism of the holy ghost because when you are preaching the gospel to everyone this is going to be part of not just your testimony but part of what you're teaching and you have to be able to communicate it because we can't let these these new people, these babes in Yeshua, walk in and not know what they're what they're dealing with and not understand it. We, we that is a practice that has got to stop. They need to be educated, and we need to make sure that they understand this because if you don't know what it is and you don't have any any idea why it's necessary you're not going to be as invested in pursuing it but when you understand all that comes with it and you understand the importance you're gonna want it you're gonna be asking him every day hey i want your spirit 
come on, let's do this. So if you um, if you have the Holy Ghost, just keep seeking deeper and deeper. If you don't have the Holy Ghost and you have been baptized in the name of Yeshua, talk to God about it. Tell him, I want your spirit. What do I need to do? Reveal to me what's keeping me from, from, from having this. Keep pursuing. Be relentless and don't give up. If you haven't been baptized yet, find someone to baptize you in the name of Yeshua. Make sure that they explain that. Again, another lesson for another day, but you need to understand exactly what you're getting into when you're baptized. But um, just keep pursuing him and, and, and don't give up and don't be discouraged. And that's all I got for today. Jehovah bless you. Pray with the people and say goodbye. Okay. So we're going to pray. Any, or am I supposed to see if there's any comments? Okay. All right. Well, then let's pray. Jehovah, thank you for bringing us together today and thank you for putting the right people in this in this lesson giving giving the putting the ears that need to hear this where they need to be lord move on all of us if we've already got the holy ghost lord give give us a deeper relationship with you if we don't have the holy ghost lord please set our hearts on fire to pursue you plow our hearts lord and make us ripe and fertile and ready to receive everything that you have to give so that we can keep growing in you and have a deeper and deeper and more meaningful relationship with you and carry us through the rest of this day and the rest of your sabbath and lord thank you so much for your sabbath it is such a blessing it is such a blessing to be able to gather with with like-minded people and you bring all these wonderful people into our lives and bring us together and bring us unity we're a family lord and continue to deepen those relationships as well so that we are knit closer and closer together and i thank you for all of your provision yes. all the forms of provision you have been so good to us. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> Am I? I don't know how to work yours. My house is right next to the end. Yeah. It is the end of the place for us. Well, I, I don't have my glasses on. Micah, can you see? The red.